I'd like to tell you that um, we always pay attention 100% in the back whenever we are uh, doing screens and we never talk. Um, but uh, when, when I realized that there was a mistake made on the screens, uh, I told Mr. Harvey it was his fault. It was his first week back there, and so he was the new guy again, so he caught the blame for it. Um, but it was really, it was really my, my, my fault. Um, but uh, it's a blessing to be here with you this morning. Am I way too loud out there? Because I'm almost feeding back right here. I don't know how to tell you how to fix it. I'm sorry. Just pull it down. Okay. Um, it's a blessing to be uh, with y'all this morning. Uh, Brother Micah asked me earlier this week, uh, and, and whenever he asked, uh, there you are, uh, Brother Glenn or Mr. Glenn or Bubba, whatever you want to call him. You have so many names. I just want you to know that. I don't ever know what to call you. Um, <laughs> But uh, it, it's, it's a blessing to be here uh, this morning. Uh, Brother Micah is taking uh, some well-deserved uh, vacation uh, this week, and, and uh, I, I can't speak highly enough about him. I know that y'all don't necessarily get to see the workings of the week, but um, this time apart, he has put in countless, countless hours to make sure that uh, his the people of the church are, are well taken care of and, and, and having content uh, continually. So uh, uh, he's a blessing for me to sit under as well as Brother Glenn. Um, but I hope and I pray that you understand just how much he loves you and just how much he, he cares about uh, his church. So when he asked me to do this, the first thing he asked me was, uh, he said, I know it's kind of late notice. Do you have something? And I said, well, of course, I have something. So uh, I, I went back to a message. I don't know if you know this or not, but we were getting ready to start youth back several weeks ago whenever we ended up having to cancel church. And so I had started working on something then uh, for the youth when we came back. And uh, that got canceled, so I ended up kind of at the same time I had been looking into and been doing a little bit of studying on suffering and what that looks like in the Christian's life and how suffering is really a blessing for the people of God. And so this week, whenever uh, I started um, getting ready and preparing for this for today, uh, I didn't really know which one to go with, so I started working on both of them. Uh, that's not recommended, just in case you were wondering. But I started working on uh, both aspects, and, and I fully intended to talk about suffering this morning. Um, but I think I'm going to go back, and we're going we're gonna to take a step back and look at, uh, this morning, what it is that we believe. And like I said, this was originally uh, started and geared for the youth, but it has great importance, not just in our young people's lives, but in all of our lives. So this morning we're going to talk about what it is that we believe, and specifically we're going to talk about what it is we believe about Scripture. And I know that this is uh, very simple or seemingly simple, and, and, and it's basic, and it's uh, base level, foundational, if you will. So much of it you're going to know, much of it you're going to have heard before, if not all of it. And prayerfully, this is, this is just a recap. This is something that we already know and are learning and continuing to uh, follow. But this is fundamental for our faith. And in saying that it's fundamental for our faith, I don't want us to check out. I know at the beginning of each sports season, uh, when, you, when, we, when the teams come together, one of the first things that you work on after you run and, and condition, uh, one of the first things that you work on is your fundamentals and the foundation of the sport, right? Because everything is built off of that. It doesn't really matter what sports you're playing. And so I want us to go back to that, to go back to the foundation, to go back to the fundamentals. Because we're in times in our country that we haven't seen as much of before. And I say that not realizing that I'm only 27 or 26 years old. I think I'm 27 now. Uh, I say that knowing that I'm only 27 years old. But I know in talking with grandparents and talking with others that in large part, believers and Christians in the United States 
have lived a very easy life. We have not suffered when we look at the comparison of suffering in other parts of the world and other countries. And that's a blessing. That's nothing that I think we should be ashamed of or anything like that. But what it has done is it's led us to a point of complacency in what we believe. And that complacency is now being challenged in very, very quickly and in so many ways. With that change, with the culture changing now, we're starting to see actual, what I would say is actual real rejection for our faith. Where before you may have gotten brushed off, now you're actually seeing real rejection for following Christ. Maybe not as much here, but definitely in other places in our country, we're starting to see this. And our young people especially, and if you don't know this, if you don't qualify for young people anymore, I want you to know that our young people are being challenged very, very heavily in what they believe. Whether And what, by young people, I mean high school, college, and so forth. Um, they, they are being introduced to ideas that maybe they've never heard before uh, on the regular, and they're being challenged by people that are actually very smart, very intelligent people. And sadly, what we're seeing, or what I have seen, and, and I've seen this uh, in, in my own personal life and in many other cases, is that when we encounter these things, when Christians encounter uh, these ideas that are coming in, when Christians encounter uh, questions, when they encounter the changing of the culture, they're folding under the pressure of following Christ. We see that largely, and, and I say this because we've seen multiple, multiple Christian authors, and I use that term Christian loosely, Christian authors. We've seen multiple Christian pastors, and I'm talking mainstream people. We've seen multiple Christian uh, artists as far as music either abandon the faith entirely or uphold things that are not biblical. We're seeing this very, very regularly, and I, I, I personally very much believe that this is due to a lack of fundamental knowledge of, of, of Scripture and fundamental knowledge of what we believe as Christians. These pressures against Christianity are growing much more quickly than, than we anticipated that they would, I think. Uh, I think people have known this, been coming for a long time. We started talking about this several years ago whenever the big rise in the homosexual movement came up and people were predicting 10, 12, 15 years before we actually got to the point where we're at now. It happened in about three. And so we're seeing a rapidly growing uh, opposition to Christianity and Christian morals. And this is most prominently seen recently if you watch the news at all, which um, you can... Uh, chastise me later, I guess. I don't like to watch the news. It makes me angry, so I try to avoid it. Um, but if you watch the news at all, if you're not seeing something about coronavirus, you're seeing something about the homosexual community, the LGBTQ plus community, and you're also seeing uh, a lot, or at least I do on my news feed, to see a lot about the murdering of babies and the in, in many ways, praising of abortion in that case. And I don't want us to be uh, confused in the fact that these two fronts, these two ideas that are challenging our country, that are challenging Christians today, are very much an attack on the basis of our faith as Christians. I say that because if we look at what these things actually mean, if we take just a second and we look into what abortion is, which is murder, we look into what the killing of these uh, innocent children is, 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 is murder. And what it's really telling us and what it's telling people in many cases is that life is not sacred. It's not worth keeping. That people, if you're an inconvenience to me, your worth and your purpose is not worth protecting. And that fundamentally goes against what Scripture says about human life. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, God is, 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 is making man, and he says right there, let us make man in our image. And then it goes on to say that in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he made them. So we as people are made in the image of God. Everyone that walks on this earth is an image bearer of God, and that 
gives you worth because you're made in His image. And that doesn't start when you're grown. It doesn't start when you become a, uh, a, a bigger child. Psalms, 1, uh, Psalms 139, verses 13 and 14 says that you formed me that you formed my you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So from beginning, from conception, we are are, are made and being made and, 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 and stitched together in, in our in our mother's womb. And we, at that very point, have worth because of the one that we are made after. One more verse to uh, support that, Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, when Jesus is talking about the things that uh, they were worrying about, these different things and how they were going to take care of themselves. God uh, likens them to the birds. He says, do you see the birds? Do you see how uh, wonderful they are, how, how beautiful they are, how well taken care of they are? And then he makes a contrast. He says, are you not worth more than the birds? So don't be mistaken. This movement, this push, whatever you call it, whatever whatever banner it hangs under, this murdering of children is fundamentally undermining the value of life that God has given us as people. The other movement that we talked about, the, the homosexual movement, the LGBTQ+, um, I've added about four more letters to that recently. This whole movement is the degrading of marriage that God designed. And when you degrade or when you try to change marriage, what you ultimately do then is you change the roles that God has given man and woman. You make them something that they're not. You then destroy the family, and in destroying the family, you destroy the home, and in destroying the home, you destroy the primary means in which God set up to disciple our children coming up in truth. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when we see what marriage is, it describes it to be as one man and one woman, and this is for a purpose. Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse 5, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31, again reaffirm Genesis chapter 2. So it's not just once in Scripture that we see what marriage is. It's affirmed again in Matthew by Jesus. It's affirmed again in Ephesians by Paul. And the reason for that is, one, marriage is a picture of the gospel. God determined what it was. And two, as I said before, when you change marriage or you attempt to change marriage, the whole home life falls apart after that. Mark chapter 7 verse 21 labels uh, sexual sin outside of, or uh, sexual practices outside of marriage, all of them, not just talking to homosexuality, but that is included, labels them as sin and an abomination to God. So this whole movement undermines the teaching of Scripture that this is wrong. And these are just a couple of things. It's just a couple of examples. It's a couple of things that I'm seeing very, uh, very recently and that I'm seeing everywhere. These are things that are being embraced by young Christians and old Christians alike, for that matter. I've spoken with many people, grown people, that are supporting of abortion, yet claiming Christ at the same time. It doesn't work that way. I went to school. I've led worship with. I've cried with. I've prayed with men who very much believe that they are believers and saved that are now living lives of homosexuality openly as Christians. And they're leading others to do so. And it breaks my heart because I know these guys. I went to school with these guys. And they're not the only ones. We're seeing it everywhere. It fundamentally goes against everything that Scripture says that it is to be. If you remember, we went through the book of 1 John not too long ago. I think we spent 26 weeks in 1 John. 
Um, so it's been a little while back when we actually went through the beginning of 1 John. But if you remember, in 1 John, there was a reason that he was writing uh, this letter, and that, that writing was to address false prophets. But if you look back at, at the first part of chapter 1 of verse John, the very first thing that he does is not necessarily address the false prophets. He does that later. But the first thing that he does is he takes them back to the truth. He takes them back to the gospel. And so that's what we want to do this morning. And that's what I think as Christians we should do. We see the same type of teaching in Paul when Paul wrote his letters in regards to these churches and things that were going on in these churches. The first thing that he does is he brings them back to the truth. He brings them back to the gospel, to the foundation of their faith. And then from there addresses the problems. So that's what we want to do this morning. I want us to take a step back to look at the basics to look back at the truth so that as we go into the world, as we go about our lives, we can do two things. One, first and foremost, is not be led astray by these teachings and ideas that are being pressed upon us. The only way that we're not led astray is for us to be well grounded in what we believe. And so to do that, we must go back to the basics. And secondly, and this is, this, this is something that many people struggle with, I probably enjoy it too much. But the second thing is this. I want us to go back to the basics, not only so we won't be led astray, but so that we can also refute and rebuke these teachings. So that we can stand against these teachings. So that we can stand on something that actually has some grounds, which is the truth of the Word of God. And rebuke these things and, and, and stop and, and, and combat these false teachings that are very quickly taking over our churches and our young people in our country. So this morning, as I said earlier, we're going to talk about Scripture. Much of this we will know. I realize, especially in our younger uh, younger kids, in, in many cases, reading is not exactly popular. Okay? I know, I get it, reading can be difficult. Reading can be uh, not fun from time to time. But we must start here with the Bible because it's through Scripture, it's through the Bible that God chose to reveal everything that we know about God. If you're looking for knowledge in God in some other way, form, or fashion, you're looking in the wrong place. It starts with the Word. We saw that when we started this study through Hebrews. If you remember back um, to about week two, we talked about Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews chapter one, verses one and two, we read this, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by what? His son. He's spoken to us by his son, and how has his son spoken to us? I'm not, this isn't new to me. I think Brother Micah said this exact same thing a few weeks ago. He spoke to us through His Son, through His Word. So the Word is the foundation for what we believe. It's the foundation for what we know. And so therefore, that must be where we start. So let me give you four truths. Now, I realize that there are more than four truths, but for the sake of time and uh, everything else, uh, we're going to look at four truths about Scripture. The first is this. Scripture is inspired by God, or we could say that the Bible is inspired by God. Now, when we say inspired, I don't mean inspired like a movie's inspired. Uh, <laughs> my father-in-law, if you know him, you know he can be a nut. Uh, we were watching a movie the other night that was clearly uh, not um, anything near a true story. I like sci science, fiction, science fiction stuff, so it's science fiction stuff. And he walks in and he says, is this based on a true story? Like... Absolutely, it's based on a true story. Very vivid true story, right? I'm not talking about the Bible being inspired the way that a movie is inspired by actual events. When we say that the Bible is inspired by God, that it is the Word of God, we mean that it is, in fact, the Word of God. Second Timothy says that it is God-breathed. It's not sort of like God's Word. It's not partially like God's Word. Parts of it are God's Word, and then other parts not. All of it is the Word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, every book in between, every paragraph, verse, line, word, and letter is exactly as God intended it to be. Scripture says exactly what He intended it to say, 
from the beginning until now. And He has preserved it from the beginning until now. Scripture is still what God intended for it to be. And I think many times we miss how crazy awesome that is. I mean, think about that for just a second. A perfect, holy, righteous God gave His very words to a sinful, undeserving people so that we may know Him. That's crazy. We read Scripture, or so often we don't read Scripture, and we miss just how incredible it is that God saw fit to do that when He didn't have to. The first objection that you typically hear to this, and and if you've spoken to uh, anybody really, then the first thing that you hear is, well, God didn't write the Bible, man did. It says so in the Bible. I mean, it actually, they introduced themselves in most of the letters, right? Man actually wrote the Bible. That's what they'll say. And in part, they're not wrong. Man did write the Bible. But they're missing something very important here. These men that wrote Scripture, these men that spoke in the Old Testament, weren't speaking or writing according to themselves. They were speaking and they were writing according to God. They were speaking on the behalf of God. If you were to look back in uh, the Old Testament throughout uh, the first five books and then uh, the prophets that follow, 1,900 times you see men claim to speak on behalf of God. You hear things like Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 3, when Moses spoke to the uh, people of Israel At the end of his uh, telling them what God had said, it said, And Moses spoke according to all that God had given him. When Moses spoke, it was specific. It was exactly what God had said for his people. And throughout all the prophets, we see verses like Isaiah chapter 66, 1. That's just an example. But they start with this phrase, Thus says the Lord, right? Thus says the Lord. I can't remember who it was. I think it may have been uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul, who's one of my favorites, that said, uh, um, or maybe maybe it was Bodie Bauckham. He said, uh, if you say, thus says the Lord, it better have a chapter and verse following it. That's what that means. Thus saith the Lord, you are saying this is what God says. And that's what we see in the Old Testament. We can trust that what is written in the Old Testament is the words of God because the men that spoke it, the men that uh, wrote this down, believed that they were speaking from God. And it was affirmed by God that they were speaking on His behalf. We can trust that the Old Testament is the very words of God. If you need a little more uh, evidence or assurance of the Old Testament being the Word of God, The New Testament writers believed that it was the Word of God. I did a little bit of a little bit of research, and I couldn't find a definite answer. But somewhere between 850 and 930 times is the Old Testament referenced in the New Testament in some way or shape. That tells you that the New Testament writers believed that the Old Testament held weight. The men who wrote what we know as the New Testament now believed that God had dictated the Old Testament. And in regards to the New Testament, Jesus Himself gave us assurance that it was the words of God. In John chapter 14, you can turn there, in John chapter 14, verse 26, in speaking to His disciples, Jesus tells them, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send to you in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to you remembrance all that I have said to you. The Holy Spirit was the one that was the promise to uh, help them, the Helper. He was the promise of the one that would come and lead them. These men, remember, are the ones that wrote much of this, right? They were teaching and they were saying and they were doing according to what the Spirit Said In John chapter 16, verse 13, we also find, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. 
For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So again, we see that the Holy Spirit led these men and what they taught and what they said and what they wrote. And it, and it was maintained that way. Two more passages, and these will be more well known to you. Two more passages pointing us to God's authorship of Scripture. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 16. Well, if I can get there. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And if you jump over to verses 20 and 21, it then says this, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So again, we see, yes, men did write Scripture. Men did write the Bible. But they didn't write it on their own. And they were very, very clear on this. They wrote according to and as the Holy Spirit carried them along in doing so. One other verse, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I believe I, and I, believe I referenced it earlier. Chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good works. So we see there again, the Scripture is the breath of God. It's breathed out by God. It is the words of God. And listen, for Christians and for believers, we, we should believe this. We should know this. We should trust that the Word of God is God's Word. That, 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 that the Scriptures, that the Bible is the Word of God. And so in some ways, it really makes sense. I think about my dad. Uh, some of y'all know him, some of you don't. But I remember uh, I, I, I was a very inquisitive young man. Um, I guess I still am sometimes, but I was a very inquisitive young man, and so I asked Dad about 6,000 questions for everything. And his number one response was always, because I said so. And that was good enough. There was no discussion after that. When he said, because I said so, it meant it really don't matter, but you're going to do it anyway. <laughs> okay? That's exactly what that meant. Now, at the time... That was not sufficient. I didn't like that, but he really didn't care because he was the authority in that situation, right? When he said, because I said so, that finished the discussion. Well, as believers, we can say the very same thing about Scripture. Do you know why the Bible is the Word of God? Because it said so. Scripture claims to be the Word of God. It says that it is the Word of God. And so as believers, that's the final word. I know it's kind of circular reasoning. It doesn't work in other areas and other aspects. But when the Word of God says it's the Word of God, you can't argue with that. So it is sufficient in and of itself to its claims to being the Word of God. By the way, I can't wait for the day I get to tell my son because I said so. I'm, I'm counting down the days, man. I'm excited, to, I'm excited for that. Maybe I shouldn't be, but I'm excited for that. Second truth that I want us to understand, that I want us to go back and look at regard, in regards to Scripture is this. Scripture is both inerrant and infallible. Scripture is inerrant and infallible. When we say that Scripture is inerrant, we simply mean that Scripture is without error. There is no error in it. It has never been an error in it, and there never will be. God will preserve His Word. And when we say that it's infallible, we mean that it's not only, it not only doesn't have error, it's incapable of having error. When we say that the Bible is infallible, it means that in no way could God have ever made a mistake in writing it. 
That's hard for us to understand. That's hard for me to understand. Because I know how easy it is for us to mess up, and we don't even intend to, right? You can, in, in all sincerity, work as hard as you can and still make a mistake and never realize that you made one. But God doesn't do that. We know that the Bible is both uh, without error and incapable of error because of God's authorship in it. The Bible is incapable of error and without error because God is incapable of error. Because God is without error. We can trust this. If we look at Numbers 25, 16, and then again in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18, they, they, uh, Hebrews, talk, Hebrews references Numbers, says that God is not man that he should lie. God never lies. So it stands to reason then that God never lies, right? So there's never a lie in his word. There's never anything wrong with his word. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2, Paul in his greeting makes regard makes makes regards to the certainty of God's promises. Now, in, in Titus, he's speaking specifically to salvation in this passage, but he references again that God never lies according to His promises. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, we see that in God there is no darkness, meaning there is no sin, there is no error, there is no nothing lacking in God. Then in turn, we can say that there is no sin, there's no wrong, there's no error in His Word. Because God is that way. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, Let's turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. This is a great verse. It says this, The rock, His work is perfect, for all His ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is He. This is what is spoken about the God who is the author of the Bible. So we can trust that the Bible is likewise. It is perfect. It is justice. It is faithful. It's without sin. And it's upright and just. Just as He is. In Psalms chapter 18, verse 30, says that His way is perfect. The Word of the Lord proves true. In John chapter 17, verse 7, Jesus Himself, speaking of the Word of God, says that the Word of God is truth. And if we look back in chapter 10, verse 35, He then says that Scripture cannot be broken. You see a pattern here? You see the pattern of how God is without fault and error? That God is incapable of fault and error? James speaks to this fact as well. Then it's, it's right to assume that if the author is incapable of error, then his work is as well. Then the Bible is incapable of error as well. The Bible must be in error and it must be infallible because... The very character of God is inerrant and infallible. Thirdly, Scripture is authoritative. Scripture is authoritative. When we say authoritative, we mean the authority. Not a authority. Not somewhat an authority. Not a lesser authority. But the Bible is the authority. So many times, I think, whenever we see people talking with uh, atheists, and, I, and I've done so myself, and, and, and I've, I've been convicted of this since then, uh, you hear things like, well, I don't believe that the Bible is the authority. So then our next go-to is, well, okay, well, what, what, do you believe the, what do you believe is authority? And then we try to use that to prove that the Bible is the authority. What have we done then? We've just said that the Bible's not an authority, right? We just took science or reason or logic or whatever it is that this person believed, and then we tried to prove the Bible with it 
And in doing so, we undermine the authority of the Bible. The Bible is the final authority. There's nothing beyond it. There's nothing greater than it. And everything must conform to it. And in fact, everything does conform to it. There's nothing greater. Human reason, which we hold so high in esteem in our, in our world today, right? Like the height of intelligence is being able to think, think of it yourself, which is foolishness. Because <laughs> I know myself, I'm coming with some crazy ideas. Science, though people try to disprove Scripture with science, all they end up doing is proving what the Bible already said. It's the craziest thing to watch. People try to use all kind of manner of things to undermine the authority of Scripture. And the bottom line is, it falls short in every way. We know that the Bible or we know that Scripture is the final, ultimate authority, again, for the very same reason we know that it's without error. Because God is. God is the final authority. In Genesis chapter 1, when He created everything, right? God made everything that ever was from nothing. He's author and creator of our universe. And therefore, He holds authority over Everything He created. We see God's authority over Satan in passages like Job, chapter 1, verse 12, and chapter 2, verse 6. Whenever Job comes before God, I mean, whenever Satan comes before God and he recommends, God recommends Job to him, hey, have you thought about him? You can do this, but no more. And what does Satan do? He follows what God said. Why? Because he is the ultimate authority, even over Satan. We see God's authority, and we see it through Jesus in His time on earth. We see God's authority over the dead in John chapter 11 when He raised Lazarus from the dead. We just watched with a slight, well, I, I, I say watched. I use that term loosely. Slade doesn't like TV. So we it's on, and we try to get him to pay attention. And he has like the song at the end of the, of the show is his favorite. It's a, it's a show called Superbook. It's fantastic. Uh, I mean, verbatim, quotes, quotes out of Scripture. It's awesome. The only thing he likes is the closing song. So uh, he stops and listens to it, and then he goes nuts after that. But the other day, uh, just uh, either yesterday or the day before, uh, we watched the one about Lazarus. And it was, it was neat. It was cool to see because I had been looking at this. And so to see that, I thought, wow, what a miracle. What a miracle. We... we, we we kind of downplay it, I think, in our mind, or I do. We downplay the miracle of raising someone from the dead. But we see God's authority over the dead in that and many others. That's just one example. We see God's authority when Jesus healed the many sick. We see it all over Scripture, all over His time on earth. And we see His authority when, we see His authority when Jesus calmed the storm in Matthew chapter 8. Or when he walked on water in Matthew chapter 14, everything falls under the authority of God. Everything. And because God is authoritative, because he is the final authority, so is his word. And believer, when you are talking to, speaking to, proclaiming the gospel to someone, don't ever abandon the authority of Scripture. Whether they, whether they acknowledge it as their authority or not, it is. Vody Bauckham said at one point, uh, he was talking about uh, this very subject, and he, he said that, um, that the, the, Bible is, uh, uh, the Bible is like a sword. He said, uh, they say, well, I don't believe in the Bible, he said, and so you hit them with it again. And they don't believe the Bible, and you hit them with it again. And I don't believe the Bible, and you hit it with it again, he said, because they're either going to surrender to it, or it won't matter. The Bible is the final authority. Don't ever abandon that because when you abandon Scripture, you now have no grounds to stand on. Lastly is this, and I'll close with this, and this will be very short. 
Scripture is sufficient. Scripture is sufficient. We just saw this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Scripture is sufficient for teaching, for reproof, for correction. And that verse closes out by saying it is sufficient for everything to make you complete for good works. The Bible is sufficient, believer, for you. You need nothing more. The Word of God is sufficient for us as we follow Christ. It's sufficient for us to learn. It's sufficient for us to grow in knowledge of Him. It's sufficient for us as we walk through this life seeking to live a holy life because He's told us to. It's sufficient for training us in greater righteousness. There is no greater enlightenment that brings you above all these things. You're always subject to this, and the Scripture is always sufficient for you. And likewise, for those that don't believe, Scripture is sufficient for you as well. Scripture is sufficient for you as you trust on Christ. It's sufficient to save you. It holds the power of the Gospel. It holds the message of the Gospel. And in the gospel of salvation. Whether you realize it or not, as, as one who doesn't believe, whether you realize it or not, uh, whether you reject it or not, this book holds what you need. So my call to you then would be this. Repent and trust on the gospel that's found in it. Repent and trust on Him. Understand that you are sinful, that you are not good, that you are not perfect, that you have offended a holy God. And in offending Him, you're destined for hell. And there's only one escape. There's only one way out. And that's to trust on Christ, to surrender your sin, to put your faith in Him to follow Him, to love Him, to trust Him, to know Him. And He'll change your life from there. There are many, many people that can attest to the transformative power of the Word of God. If you call yourself a Christian, you can. So if you're here and you don't know Christ, or if you're watching and you don't know Christ, I urge you to turn from your sin and trust on Him. Believers, if you're here, I, I, I challenge you. Go back to the basics of what we believe. They are being challenged right now. Your children are being challenged in their faith. Your children are being challenged wherever they're at with what you're teaching them at home, with what you're grounding them in Scripture. So ground them in Scripture. Because only when they're grounded in Him, in Christ, in the Word, only when they're grounded in Him, can they stand against the foolishness that this world is bringing against them? We're seeing it more and more. I'm seeing it more and more. Spent just a little bit of time at the schools here in the last few weeks, and there are some very confused people. You work with some very confused people. But thankfully, I have the pleasure of not working with confused people. <laughs> at least I hope they're not. <laughs> But there are some very confused people, and we will be challenged in our faith. And so I, I, I challenge you and I urge you, get back to the basics, get back to the fundamentals of our faith. Trust on Christ, trust in His Word, trust in what He's done. Don't abandon that, because without it, we can't stand I think uh, I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask the. I think I'm going to ask the uh, the deacons to stand at the doors. Is that right, Brother Glenn? Okay. I'm going to ask the deacons to stand at the doors for our offering, and uh, after we pray, uh, you'll be dismissed. If you if you'd like to talk to anybody, um, I know Mike is not here, but he will be. He'll be back. Uh, Brother Glenn's here. I'm here. Find somebody who you know loves the Lord and trust. Talk with them. Pray with them. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for the day. Thank you for um, your word. God, I thank you that your word is sufficient. God, I thank you that your word is powerful.
And God, I thank you that you have preserved your word. I know that that is, seems to be a, up for discussion, God, but you would never let your word fall by the wayside. So God, I pray for us as a congregation, as a, as a church, God, Lord, I pray that you would help us to stand in your truth, to stand on your word, God, to get back to the basics, Lord, not, not necessarily to stay there, Father, but never to abandon the basics. Father, I pray for us as a church as we go, Father, that as we, as we come into contact with these things that are coming, as we come into contact with these uh, ideas and teachings and, and beliefs, Father, that, that are contrary to your word, Lord, I pray that you would, I pray that you would uh, help us to endure through that. Lord, that you would carry us through, Father, that you would uh, strengthen us in those times, strengthen us through those times. Father, I pray that you would help us to not only stand, but God, that you would help us to stand against those things. Lord, forgive me for times that I have not. Forgive us for the times that we don't speak against wrong, that we don't speak against evil. Father, we love you. We thank you, God. We know that above everything else that you are sovereign. We know above everything else that you're in control, God. Nothing happening is a surprise. Nothing happening is outside of what you've known and what you have decreed. So, Father God, I pray for the perseverance of your church, as you've promised we will. Lord, be with us as we go. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.